let us um, start. So, dear Ajahn, is the Deva Dutta Sutta about King Yama legit? <laughs> Aren't we reborn immediately according to our Kama without giving, uh, going through a trial? Uh, also, who does the Sangha refer to according uh, to the Sutta? As many places have different definition, uh, definitions for it. Uh. Okay, thank you. So, uh, the Deva Dutta Sutta, is it legitimate? Uh, about King Yama and all that. Uh, and what I should really do is bring the sutta out so I can actually see the suttas as, as they are, uh, as they are, so I can get the exact wording of these things. Uh, but um, basically, the Deva Dutta Sutta, the way it uh, works, uh, if you read it carefully, you will actually see that King Yama doesn't make any judgment. Uh, this is what you ha so you have to be very careful how you read it. Uh, uh, and what it says there, it basically says, King Yama says to the man, well, you know, shouldn't you have known better? And then the man says, yeah, I suppose, uh, yeah. Uh, well, what do you expect, you know, when you don't know better, what do you expect will happen? And it's almost as if, when you read it in the right way, that uh, he is actually judging himself. Let me, just hold on one minute, I'll get the sutta, because it's more clear when I have it in front of me than when I just... Uh, going by memory. So let me just, just hold on one second and I'll get it from my from behind here. If I can get my legs untwisted. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here we go. This one. So we have the uh, Deva Dutta Sutta, uh, and it is in the Anguttara 3s. Anguttara 3s, number, what is it, number 36, is that right? Uh, Anguttara 3 is 36. Uh, Okay, so here we here we have it. So this is this is the uh, the one with Yama, King Yama, right? So this is how it how it goes. Uh, so I'll read it out for you. So uh, because there are these three divine messengers, what three? Here, someone engages in misconduct by body, speech, and mind. In consequence, with the breakup of the body after death, they are reborn in the plane of misery, in a bad destination in the lower world in hell. There the wardens of hell grab him by both arms and show him to King Yama, saying, This person, your majesty, did not behave properly towards his mother and father. He did not behave properly towards ascetics and Brahmins. He did not, behave, he did not honor the elders of his family. May your majesty inflict due punishment on him. So then, his, and then King Yama questions, interrogates, and cross-examines him about the first divine messenger. Good man, did you, uh, uh, did you, didn't you see the first divine messenger that appeared among human beings? Uh, and uh, he replies, No, Lord, I did not see him. Uh, then King Yama says to him, But good man, uh, didn't you ever see among human beings a man or a woman, eighty, ninety, or a hundred years of age, frail, bent like a roof bracket, crooked? wobbling as they go along, leaning on a stick, ailing, youth gone with broken teeth, with grey hair, scanty hair, or bald, 
with wrinkled skin and blotched limbs. Uh, and the man replied, Yes, I have seen this. Uh, then King Yama says to him, Good man, didn't it occur to you, an intelligent and mature person? I too am subject to old age. I am not exempt from old age. Let me do good by body, speech and mind. No, Lord, I could not. I was heedless. Then King Yama says, Through heedlessness, good man, uh, you failed to do good by body, speech uh, or mind. Surely they will treat you in a way that fits your heedlessness. That bad karma of yours was not done by your mother or father, nor by your brother or sister, uh, nor by your friends and relatives, uh, nor, by, uh, nor by your companions and family members, uh, nor by the deities, nor by ascetics and Brahmins. Rather, you were the one who did that bad karma, and you yourself will have to experience its results. So you can see here that what's happening is that King Yama is not really doing anything at all. He's just uh, questioning him. Uh, and then towards the end he tells him, well, you know, this is how Kama works. Uh, you know, if you do bad things, then you can expect bad results. Uh, and the man himself says, well, I was heedless. I was stupid. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, so King Yama here, to, to my mind, functions almost like your conscience does. Uh, your conscience tells you that I, you know, I did, I did wrong. I made a mistake. Uh, and uh, King Yama is like the little voice at the back of your head uh, who tells you that you did a bad, you were a bad person <laughs> and you did bad things because of that. Uh. So you have to read this suit as carefully and then you kind of, uh, I think the meaning comes out. So uh, King Yama here is probably more like a, uh, it's probably part of the Indian culture, uh, uh, but the way it is used in the sutta, it is not used as a, as an inter interrogator or as someone who judges you or anything like that. Uh, it just used a rem as a reminder of what you have, what you have done. Uh. So uh, that is uh, uh, what that is about as far as I can tell. Uh, um, uh, so are we reborn immediately according to our kamma without giving, uh, going through a trial? Uh, uh, sort of, uh, maybe not immediately, but certainly you are reborn according to your kamma. Okay, so second one. Also, who does the Sangha refer to according to the suttas? As many places have different defini definitions for it. And Sangha, usually the Sangha just means the, um, uh, the ordinary bhikkhus and, and bhikkhunis, yeah, the whole Sangha. You t we take refuge, for example, in the Sangha. And that uh, there, in, in that case, it only means the whole Sangha of bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. Uh, but the Arya Sangha, as it actually you have in this particular instance here, means the noble people. Uh, and in this case, it uh, still probably refers to the Sangha in terms of monastics, but a, a subset of that Sangha, only those monastics who are um, uh, noble ones. Uh, and sometimes there has been an argument, does the Sangha in this case mean all people who are noble ones, regardless of whether they are monastic or not? Uh, and uh, Probably not, because when you read the, uh, uh, the, the definition there, it says that they are worthy of, uh, for example, hospitality and gifts and offerings. Uh, and this is always a reference to the monastic Sangha. It doesn't really refer to lay people, even if they are noble ones. Uh, it doesn't actually refer to that. Uh, this is a standard way of talking about the monastic Sangha in the world. The field of merit, uh, the field of merit is usually the, the Sangha, because that's where it is most likely you, you will find the noble ones, the Aryans. Uh, so um, I think uh, Arya Sangha, for that reason, is always, or the Sangha is always a reference to the uh, monastic Sangha, but uh, kind of various uh, uh, sizes, various aspects of it. Uh, uh, it's becoming more and more common around the world now to refer to the Sangha as your spiritual community. Yeah? This is my Sangha, uh, and this kind of refers to your, your friends, uh, yeah? who you hang out with uh, in, the, in the kind of spiritual life. Uh, this is my Sangha. And uh, in, in, in a sense, it, uh, it, is, um, it is, you know, according to the word Sangha, the word Sangha, the root meaning is just a group. Yeah, so the Sangha is a group of people coming together. So Sangha means group, 
Ghana is a smaller group. Uh, so in that sense, it kind of works. But uh, it goes a little bit against how it is used in the suttas. Uh, and it gets very confusing. And then when you start reading the suttas, uh, because you have learned that Sangha means your kind of local meditation group in your little town, wherever you live, uh, that's the Sangha. Then when you read the suttas, you think that's the meaning in the suttas as well. And then you misconstrue the suttas accordingly because of that. Uh. So it can have detrimental effects when we, when we do that. Uh. But in the sutta, sometimes you see a, a sangha of birds. Uh, yeah, it means a group of birds. Uh. So sangha is sometimes also used in that sense of a group of beings or a group of things coming together. Okay. So that is about yama and sanghas. That's quite that's good, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Let's go on to the uh, next question. Huh? Um. Dear Ajahn, uh, causing schism, a split in the Sangha, is a serious offence. Uh, how about causing split in lay groups, uh, making people turn against each other? Uh, yes, it is not a good idea. <laughs> and uh, it is not as serious as causing a split in the Sangha. You don't go to hell for doing that, uh, probably, not straight away anyway, it might take a while. Huh? <laughs> Uh, and if you do cause a, splism with a, a schism with malicious intent in the Sangha, then it's supposed to be very, very serious. Uh. But um, in uh, lay groups, uh, the, I think it probably causing split is often, uh, uh, often uh, combined with wrong speech, yeah, the speech that causes disharmony. Uh, and the kind of disharmonious speech often can, not often can, but sometimes can, end up a split in lay groups. Uh. So it is uh, probably somehow perhaps related to that. Uh, um, but uh, so generally speaking, if we do things that kind of break people apart and cause disharmony in society, cause disharmony in groups, uh, starting with speech, uh, then that is really, I think, uh, that is kind of the main thing that we uh, need to look out for. If you deliberately cause a, a breaking apart beyond the speaking disharmonious speech, obviously you are compounding the problem even more. Uh, but it, it is the disharmony in speech that is the main concern in the suttas and the vinaya. The, the, the sut I don't think there's anything in the suttas about causing schism in, in, uh, a peep in group in society. It doesn't actually say anything about that. Uh, it's only really about speech. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure how much worse it is. Uh, uh, presumably it must be a little bit worse because it, you're, making the, you're making it more kind of severe by acting it out. Uh, but. Uh, I don't think there is any uh, kind of uh, major repercussions. The reason why it is so bad in the Sangha is because uh, this is the teaching of the Buddha. Yeah? Here you have something that is can be incredibly beneficial for society. And then if you break apart a Sangha that is so beneficial, you're destroying uh, an institution that has the uh, benefit for doing enormous good in the world. Uh, and then you're breaking it apart and some of those people will be led astray. Uh, very often a schism it has to do with wrong view and wrong ideas. Uh, and the faction who are led, led, us, led away by wrong views, uh, they will, be, they, will, they will be led astray from all of the potential of the Dhamma, yeah? And that is obviously a big part of the problem. Uh, if, you, if you divide a lay group, like, uh, you know, say someone divides BGF into, you know, the, n the new BGF and the old BGF or something like that, uh, yeah? <laughs> Uh, then uh, it may not have so much repercussions because uh, it may not mean that one is going astray and the other one is not. It may just mean that there is some other argument that uh, you know you go apart. Uh, so it may not really have any effect on people's spiritual life. And for that reason it may not be so important. Uh, but if the Sangha breaks apart it may actually have a dramatic effect on people's ability to practice a spiritual light in, in the right way. And for that reason it may be you know, it's particularly bad to do that. Uh. So the main thing is to watch out for that uh, divisive speech, uh, and that is difficult enough sometimes, yeah. Uh, sometimes it's easy to kind of fall prey to that sort of speech. Uh, whenever you say something bad about somebody, in a sense it is a little bit divisive already. Uh. Sometimes it's necessary, don't, don't get this wrong, sometimes it's necessary to say, say things that are a bit bad. Uh, uh, you know, typical example, if someone is abusive and you want to warn somebody about an abusive person, you, of course you have to do that, you have no choice. Uh, but that is not because you want to do something bad, in fact it is because you want to protect people. Uh, so your intention is coming from the right place. Uh, 
But if you want to divide because you are angry and upset and you're coming from the wrong place, uh, that is where when it becomes bad, uh, bad karma and also uh, a breach of what is right speech. Uh, so, as always, motivation is what tells you whether something is right or wrong. Uh, so always ask yourself about, the, about why you're doing things. Uh, and if you're doing something for the right reasons, uh, it is not usually a problem. And sometimes actually it's a good thing to do uh, and something that is necessary. Uh. Okay, uh, on the Buddha's extinguishment, he said that the monks can do away with some of the minor rules of the Vinaya. Why did the Sangha decide to keep all 227 rules? The reason for that, according to the Vinaya, is because the, uh, uh, there were some of the monks They said, well, the lay people, they already know which rules we are keeping here. So very, it's actually an interesting little passage. Let people know which rules we are keeping here. So if we get rid of these rules, they will say, they will say well, look at these monastics. As soon as the Buddha dies, they start chucking out the rules. They don't take them seriously anymore. Yeah. Yes, and you can imagine that's true. Yeah, that's kind of quite likely that would happen. Yeah. You can see when that would happen. Yeah. So this is one of the reasons why uh, they decided to keep the rules, as it is recorded in the uh, uh, Vinaya anyway. Yeah. And one thing that is very interesting about that is the fact that it's clear that the lay people knew the Vinaya. You know, these days some, sometimes you, you hear, I think it's more common, it, it, I'm not sure where it happens, it's not so common in Theravada perhaps, but sometimes you get this, you get told, actually I remember that, that was a, uh, I, that was a talk, we had a conference on Buddhism in Australia, it was a, uh, not a conference that we organized, but some other group organized, and and I remember I gave a talk at that conference uh, and I was saying something about the monastic rules. I was talking about the monastic rules uh, and there was one of the lay people there who was from some kind of uh, other kind of Buddhist school uh, from Russia or something like that. And this person, they were horrified that I could talk about the monastic rules uh, in front of lay people. That was really, really bad according to their ideas. Uh. So this is a, a problem according to some schools. Like in some schools, uh, the monastics keep the rules secret. Uh, yeah, so lay people have no idea what you're supposed to do. And, and uh, it, it, that's quite handy. If, if you want to break the rules, it's quite handy, yes, because nobody knows anyway. Oh no, no, this is, this is okay. So it, it is actually good for lay people to be a bit educated about the monastic rules, because then you know what is appropriate and what is not. Uh, and that is important, because there's supposed to be a mutual supporting support between the lay people and the monastics uh, and of course the idea is the you know the idea part of the idea is that if the monastics misbehave then the lay people tend to withdraw the support a little bit and those monastics who practice well well then you tend to get a little bit more support and that is one of the ways in which the sangha and the whole buddhism regulates itself so that it doesn't go too far astray uh, so it is actually important to have that uh, knowledge and understanding among lay people, at least some of the basic rules, uh, like the Parajika rules, so that the monks don't go around murdering people, yeah? Oh no, it's okay. It's, uh, Vinaya says, we can do this. No, actually, <laughs> well, that maybe that one is too obvious, but uh, you know what I mean, that uh, if things get out of hand. Uh. Yes, Venerable. Have we got a microphone here? Uh? It has to be recorded, you see, here. Uh. Otherwise, it doesn't get recorded. That's that's the way it works. Uh, yeah. Okay. You know, uh, Ajahn hmm. Kugri. Yes. He's also the Ajahn Chah's disciple. Hmm. He teaches that uh, originally the monks ruled only 150. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, what I think about that, uh, I think there may well be some truth to that, uh, because there is uh, two suttas in the Anguttara Nikaya threes uh, that say that the monks had o o just over 150 rules. Uh. Yeah, there's actually yeah. two suttas like that, and uh, so this, uh, so uh, and some of the rules in the Vinaya, uh, they. Uh, uh, there is some grounds for thinking that they may not have been there early on, like this many of the Sekya rules, uh, for example. Uh, mm. And the reason for that is because they vary quite a lot according to the different traditions. Uh, uh, the Savastivadans have 112 uh, Sekya rules. Uh, 
the uh, uh, Theravadans have 75, the Mahasangikas have 66, so the number varies a lot. So there seems to have been a lot of addition to the Seika rules after the Buddha passed away. Yeah. And in the bhikkhunis it's even worse, yeah. for the bhikkhunis it's even more rules that probably were added, yeah. because if you look at the bhikkhu ni Patimoka, so I think there is some grounds for saying that, but it's very hard to say exactly which rules. Uh, uh, but, uh, but you know, th quite likely that the, this most of the Seika rules have been added later on. Uh, yeah. He just what that's what he you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think <laughs> I think uh, you may have a point. Many yeah. many Thai yeah. monks mm. are against him. Yeah. For teaching. Yeah. So he he teach only the the Buddha's words. Mm. You know put. Mm. That's, that's all he teaches. I know, yeah. I met him a few years ago. I went to see yeah. him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's what yeah. all he emphasized. Everything, yeah. the Buddha's words. Yeah. Nothing, nothing else. Nothing else, yeah. S exactly. So I think, I, think that's kind of, I think that's fair enough. I don't think he went very wrong, but I know he was pressured by the Thai hierarchy to... Uh -huh. he, st he started reciting the Patimokkha with only 150 rules, uh, yeah? Right. He took out the Seikya rules and just, and just did the 150 rules, uh, and then the Thai Harika said, oh, okay, put them back in again, or we will, we will do something. I don't <laughs> know what they were going to do, but they were going to do something. Yeah. And so they, they don't pressure, uh, yeah. chant, you know, morning or evening chanting, oh yeah, like, yeah. like we do. We, we don't do that, sir. No, I mean, uh, <laughs> at the temple, are you... Temple, we do morning and evening chanting, right? No. Yeah. No. You don't? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. No? No, of course. No, we don't. Uh, yeah, because this is a, this is a Thai, Thai tradition. This is what are they doing? Thai? Yeah. We don't do any morning and evening chanting in Bodhinada Monastery. Yeah. No? No. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we do Parita chanting every when, once a week. That's all the chanting we do pretty much. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they, in, uh, yeah. in his. Uh, Community, they yeah. don't do the yeah. chanting, but the rest of the Thai temple they do. Okay, do morning and yeah. evening chanting. Okay. Oh really? Is okay, so is that a legal legal requirement in Thailand to do the to do the chanting? Yeah. Well, it's a uh, common uh, practice. Yeah, but it's not it's not an absolute requirement. Uh. No, it's not no. a requirement. But yeah. only only in his community yeah. that they don't do the chanting. Okay. Okay, I think there must be some other place as well, because some of the forest tradition in Thailand is only ad in the Ajahn Shah tradition, where they had uh, morning and evening meetings. Uh, and some of the forest tradition don't, didn't have morning and evening meetings, they didn't come together, uh, they didn't do meditation together, so they wouldn't have had chanting either. Uh, the chanting is only because they come together and do the meditation together. Uh, yeah. So they, uh, just for, to inform you, that the rules that we are talking about that he, uh, he took out of the Patimokkha are called the Sekya rules, uh, and these are the most minor rules in the Patimokkha, uh, and they mostly have to do with etiquette and that sort of thing. You know, you're not supposed to, if someone is wearing shoes, you shouldn't teach them Dhamma, and that kind of, that kind of thing. That's what the rules are about. Uh. So they're very minor, and they are rules that are really about the cultural rules, yeah? And they are rules that are maybe applicable in one culture, maybe not in another one. So they are... You know, so uh, you know you shouldn't you shouldn't drink with a slurping sound, that kind of stuff. That's kind of the rules that you have in there. Sudo sudo karakang, bunji are the are the rule <laughs> rules. Uh. So uh, yes, okay, that was the first question. Uh, if a monk chose not to follow some minor rules, does it mean he is breaking the vinaya? <laughs> So if you choose not to follow some minor rules, are you, are you breaking the vinaya? Um, it, it, it depends, uh, yeah, it depends because uh, what does it mean to break a rule? If you have a rule and you deliberately break it, say, I refuse to follow this rule, then you are breaking the vinaya. But if you read a rule in a different way from someone else and your interpretation is different and, it, and you don't follow it, uh, you're not really breaking it, it's just that your interpretation is different. Uh. Of course, your interpretation has to be reasonable. You can't just interpret things exactly the way you want. Uh, so it has to be a reasonable interpretation. But if it is reasonable, uh, and you then don't follow the rule that other people may follow in that way, then it is okay. Uh, I will give you some examples. And we were just talking about the Seikya rules. Venerable was, t was mentioning the Seikya rules. And the Seikya rules say at the end, it is only if you don't follow the rule out of disrespect that you are breaking the rule. Uh, 
and then you commit the dukkata offense. Uh, so if you don't do it out of disrespect, uh, it is not breaching the rule. So say, for example, that uh, in a, one of the things it says in there is that you, can, you should not stand up and teach the Dhamma to someone sitting down. Uh, yeah? and, but in a modern context, if you go to a university, to a lecture hall, uh, the professor always stands up and everyone sits down. But it's not, it has nothing to do with disrespect, yeah? Nothing to do, it's just that this is the way we do things in the, in the modern world. Uh. So I would say that if I am told to give a talk, and this happens, happens when you go to conferences all the time, you stand at the lectern, everyone sits down. Am I breaking the vinya if I, if I give a talk? Yeah. And my answer is no, I'm doing it not because out of disrespect for the rule, I'm doing it because this is now, things, times have changed. Now this is the way we do things. Uh. So, uh, so this is how you deal with the, how you look at the rules, and all the Seika rules are like that. Uh, they're only a breach of con breach if you do it out of disrespect. If you have a good reason for not following them, there's no problem. Uh, so this is the thing with the Seika rules. Yeah, many of them you don't really have to be too concerned about anyway because they don't really apply in a in a modern context. Uh, and this is also true of some of the other rules, like the Pachitya rules, uh, which are really also minor rules. Uh, and uh, some of them will be interpreted slightly differently from people. Classic example is what is allowable for a monastic in the afternoon. There's endless kind of arguments about that. Yeah? And even though it is kind of often off a cheese, for example, is a classic example, and it's really quite irrelevant. It's a very small thing, yeah. as long as you kind of don't kind of you know become completely crazy and you start eating, you know, a big meal or whatever. That would obviously not be right. So you have to kind of have some clear boundaries. Uh, uh, so this is a classic example of what is argued a lot about among monastics. Uh, and again, as long as you uh, are reasonable about it, it's not a, it's not a big problem. Uh, there's only small things of interpretation. Uh, uh, one thing which uh, I think is uh, fairly major, is, m is more important, is the use of money among monastics. Uh, I think that is fairly important because the Buddha specifically said, uh, you know, in the suttas, he gave a sutta where it says that if you use money, you don't shine as a monastic. Yeah, yeah? And uh, so it, um, uh, it seems to be quite, quite a significant rule and you shouldn't really be doing, shouldn't really be doing that. Uh. So that is one area where I think uh, uh, we often go wrong, and it's fairly clear what is meant in that particular rule. Huh? So you have to um, remember, uh, you have to kind of um, be, uh, be reasonable about these things. Uh. I, I, I'm not saying that all monastics who use money are bad monastics at all. Uh, and sometimes some monastics who use money can be very good monastics. Uh, sometimes that is the way they were taught by their teachers, uh, and they do it as a consequence, they can still be very good. Uh. But what I'm saying is that ideally, one sh this, this is a kind of rule I think one, one should be keeping. Uh. Okay, everyone happy with that? Uh, not so happy? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Barbara? Uh, yeah. Sorry. <coughs> yeah, Bhante. Oh. What uh, about a nun who has to travel alone, uh, either in the public transport or like a taxi, or uh, yeah. somebody who is taking he, her to the somewhere? Uh, is it breaking a rule? Um, there are, there's a number of rules that could, this could come under. One of the rules for the nuns is Sangha de three for the nuns is about traveling completely on your own. Uh, and you don't break that rule because that actually means traveling completely by yourself. In public transport, there's people around, it's not really an issue. So it doesn't come under that one. Uh, there are a few other rules that are about being alone, uh, in not having a nun, or if you're a monk, not having a, another man around. And uh, uh, that uh, rule depends on the, the, uh, the, the context a little bit. It depends on actually whether you are seeking to be alone or not, uh, or whether you are using it just for as an expedient. You know, you, ha you have no choice in this matter. So, for example, if I was sitting here and everyone left except for one of the ladies, yeah, and I was suddenly found myself sitting ir in the room with one of the ladies, it, I wouldn't be breaching any rule because I wasn't seeking for l sitting alone with anyone. It just happened by accident because everyone else left. Uh, yeah, so that would be a classic example. Uh, or I, w you know, I needed some work to get done, and I, I was there was a, a, a lady who maybe who who came to the monastery. Maybe it was a lady plumber who came to the monastery, uh, 
And then I, I didn't know it was a lady plumber who was going to come around and say, so I have to show her what to do, yeah, for example. In these cases, you're not seeking to be alone with someone, so there is no, no problem there. So it actually has to be deliberately seeking to be alone with somebody for these things to be a problem here. Uh, there is another one where, b another rule, there's many rules around this, it's not easy to kind of untangle it, everything. Another one where you travel alone with someone on purpose, uh, and that rule is only broken if you yourself make direct arrangements with the driver. Uh, so if I, as a monk, make direct arrangement with a woman and say, oh, will you take me? And she says, yes, I will take you. Okay, let's go together. Then it is a breach. Uh, but if someone else makes the arrangement, and f for example, I say to uh, Bobby, could you please arrange for someone to take me to the airport? And Bobby says yes. And then the driver happens to be a woman, uh, yeah, because he, he doesn't know about my rules and I don't know what he's doing. So and uh, <laughs> then, then it, it actually, again, it is no problem. It's not really an issue because we haven't tried to make it happen. It just happens more or less by accident. Uh, so it is mo almost all of these rules are only happen if you are deliberately seeking intimacy or seeking to be with someone of the opposite gender. And you can see, so the, the rules are actually quite reasonable. Yeah, when you when you look at them, they're quite reasonable. They only breach them if you are coming from kind of defilements or trying to do something which is inappropriate. Uh, would you like to add to that, uh, Venerable? Are you happy with my... my uh, well, are you, uh, have I gone astray here? Have I <laughs> hmm. So I agree, what I said before agrees with what I'm saying now. What I said now agrees with what I said before. That's good. Huh? So I'm being consistent. That's actually, I'm very happy to hear that. That's not always the case, you know. Huh? Okay. Yes? Yeah, okay, so let's move on to the next uh, question. Here. Dear Ajahn, can Ajahn explain this on page 105? Four pairs of persons, <laughs> eight types of individuals. Uh, yes, I c I'm happy to explain that. Uh, and uh, the four pairs, uh, there are four, the, the way that the noble people are divided into, in the suttas, no, normally divided into eight kind of people, uh, yeah? So you have the uh, uh, sotapanna, yeah, the stream enterer, you have the once returner, the person who comes back to this world once, uh, non returner, uh, does never comes back to this world, uh, and then you have the arahat, four people, uh, and then you have each one of those, you have one who is on the path for each one of those. The path to stream entry, the path to one's returning, the path to non-returning, and the path to arahat. Uh, so there's like four pairs, the one who's on the path, the one who has reached it, uh, and then eight individuals. Uh, yeah, that's the f eight individuals. And, the, and all of these are areas, the different levels of areas. Uh, and uh, what happens as you be move through these different levels uh, is that you leave behind certain defilements, uh, certain fetters that bind you to samsaric existence. Yeah? So when you become a stream enter, you leave aside three fetters. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Silabata Paramasa, the holding on to uh, vows and virtues. Uh, yeah? You no, don't no longer hold on to the virtue, you become naturally virtuous. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, the Sakaya Ditti, uh, the view of a uh, a self, the view that there is some existing entity that is permanent inside of you. Uh, and the last one is the doubt. So you, uh, you don't have any doubt anymore because you've seen the teaching, you have absolute certainty about the teaching. Uh. And then as you move up to these various levels, you, 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 you throw away more fetters. So when you uh, become a, sak a Sakadagami once returner, you weaken uh, greed or uh, desire and ill will uh, and delusion. When you become an Anagami, you completely throw away ill will and desire. Yeah, no more desire and ill will. Uh. Imagine how peaceful you feel. It's what the Anagami, bang, straight into jhana, straight into samadhi, close your eyes, book jhana, like that. Uh. It's pretty, pretty good. Uh. Maybe, I can, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit. Sometimes even the anagami may take a little bit of time just to kind of become peaceful, perhaps. Uh, and then eventually the arahant, which uh, get, uh, arahant has no restlessness or any even desire for rebirth in the jhana realms and all of that is also gone. Uh. So this, um, th so gradually you throw out the defilements until all the defilements are have disappeared altogether, and this then decides the level of uh, area person you are. Uh. Question number two, please. On the same topic, 
w what is the definition of ill will according to the, you know, the Buddhist teaching? What is the definition of ill will? The definition of ill will is whenever you, is the, when you see the patiga sanya uh, in something and you focus on that, that's when ill will arises. So when you see something that you don't like, uh, something that y y y you resist, you don't want, uh, yeah, something unpleasant, uh, and then uh, uh, from that, that, that reaction, that negative reaction that you have towards that, that is uh, what is called ill will in the suttas. Uh. So it is, uh, it is like, uh, yeah. Why are you asking here? Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, I think there is, the, you know, a uh, different level of uh, reaction. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I if, uh, if you see, if I s suppose, you know, if I see something, uh, some, some, s a person that d not doing the right thing yeah. according to, you know, the Buddhist standard. Yeah. You know, like, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm yeah. and uh, I feel like, I, you know, I feel kind of not bad, but uh, I feel that, um, well, you know, she shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. And she should doing according to, you know, the good standard that we have been learning and what the Buddha taught, mm. those kind of things. Mm. And uh, it's not uh, what I have against that person, but it, it's something that I don't feel. Mm. <laughs> you know, I, I don't feel that what she's doing is right and mm. she should be doing otherwise. Yeah. Those kind of things. Yeah, and sure. it, it, that would be considered yeah, will? yeah. Um, it depends how again depends how you do it. Uh, yeah, it it's really only ill will if you feel a degree of anger. Uh, yeah, if you feel anger and you feel, uh, you know, but if you do it out of compassion because you want to help her, you want to help the sasana, that is the right attitude to have compassion in that kind of situation. She doesn't understand. Yeah, she doesn't know what she's doing. Well, even if she does understand, but she is doing it regardless, well then she's deluded. Uh, so still bad. Uh, so in all situations like that, is the right way is to have compassion for the person, for the sasana, and for also for everyone. So much better to wait if you feel a little bit of ill will arising because you think, oh, I told her a hundred times, now a hundred and one, too many times, or whatever. And, you know, it can easily happen. Um, better to wait until uh, you feel really cool about it. Uh, or if you feel really cool, you take her aside and you say no, it in the right way. No, it's been, you know, consistent. Her behavior has been <laughs> You yeah. know, consistent. It it just part yeah. of her yeah. nature. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So again, you uh, you know you have to <laughs> in in the end you have to depending on the whether it's a big or a small thing. It's, it's, it's big. It's big. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's big. Sometimes sometimes you just have to kind of tell them, okay, please go, please leave. I don't want to don't want to have you it's anymore. It's big and, uh, yeah. and not just me feeling. Yeah. Th yeah. That okay. way, many. Many. Okay. Many of us. Yeah that feeling the, the same way and we cannot yeah. and you know we cannot say anything tell her anything you know yeah. that the how we feel and uh, what should be yeah. the right thing to do because it's yeah. out of the question <laughs> <laughs> okay but well, sometimes, sometimes there's nothing you can do. You know, if people don't want to listen, they don't want to do anything. You can't do anything. There's not not much point in having. Ill, there's not much point in saying anything anymore. Huh? Just forget about it. If but you, you know, if it she doesn't listen, huh? but if you can't do anything, it doesn't doesn't make any difference. Huh? If you say or don't say, it's still the same thing. When, what's the point of saying anything here? Huh? Doesn't so make any that's sense. That's why, you know, that's yeah. why I asked what he said will be considered ill will or not. <laughs> <laughs> you have to look. I can't. It, 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 you have to look inside your own heart. I can't tell you whether it was ill will or not. It depends. Depends on your intention. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you doing it? So if you feel upset about it or, or angry, even if a little bit, yes, then there is ill will. But if you are doing it because you want to do the right thing, it is not not, not a problem. So you have to know. 
You have to. It's own, it's ill will is in the intention. Ill will is not in the action. Huh? <laughs> so, but sometimes, if it, you know, one of the things about the vinaya, if it is a very serious flaw, uh, sometimes you are allowed to tell the lay people. There's a vinaya rule that says that if someone commits a serious flaw all the time, uh, uh, you can have a sangha kama and inform the lay people that there's a problem. That's allowable. <laughs> Cannot. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Good luck. What can I say? Sometimes it's very difficult, yeah? Sometimes it's really, really hard uh, and there's nothing you can do. You just have to be equanimous at the end of the day. Uh. You just have to shrug your shoulders, you know, you, you cannot change, change people sometimes. Uh, and that's just the way it goes. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I wish there was a magic solution to these things, but uh, unfortunately there isn't. Uh. Okay, next one. Uh, why does the sutta sometimes have this phrase, Some, someone bow down to the Buddha and sat down to one side? <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, uh, this, this is uh, uh, ekamantang nisidi. Ekamantang literally means sitting down to one side. And I think I have I've actually been translating the Vinaya Pitaka myself, so I have kind of come across this. I have wondered myself, how am I supposed to translate this? Yeah? Because I don't really know what it means in kind of modern terms. Uh, but what it seems to mean is that when you come to the Buddha and come to someone, you don't just sit down right there in front of them. That would be considered rude. Yeah? So you, move, you, you bow down and then you move a little bit to one side and then you sit down. That, that seems to be the meaning. But I would say that in the, we don't have that expression in English, you sit down to one side. We, we never say that. Uh, so I actually just translate this that you bow to the Buddha and then you sit down. That's what I, how I translate this because that's uh, how it sounds better in English, in my opinion. It's more natural in English. Uh. On, the On the left side, uh, not the right side. Uh. <laughs> What's the yeah. Left side, on the left side of the Buddha. Okay. It doesn't say in the suttas. Uh. Maybe that's kind on of. Yeah, one side. Yeah, yeah. Does it? Okay. Is that, is that from the commentary? Or was it just your opinion? <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because usually when the when the monks and the nuns sit in the hall, the Buddha is always on the right, and then all the monks are sitting on the left. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Usually that's the way it is that's, that's the way it is now. It doesn't say very much in the suttas or the vinaya about how it's supposed to be, but uh, you sit according to seniority, that's what it says, uh, but it doesn't say exactly how you do that. Uh, it doesn't say... You know, when we the Sure. That's the way we do things now, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as, especially in Thailand. That's, that's kind of do you do that in Sri Lanka as well? Same thing? Okay, yeah. I don't think so. It just, no. Yeah, yeah, I think that's just the convention. We have just somehow ended up doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Do they? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 Uh, Vietnamese uh, Mahayana temple. Okay. And they asked me how many vasa, yeah. and we sit, you know, according mm. to the vasa in line. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So yeah. it's probably yeah. it, uh, it's maybe it's in the Vinaya or Mahayana Vinaya sitting also. Sitting according to vasa is in the Vinaya, so you you sit according to the you know the reins that's right. there. But it doesn't say exactly how you have to sit according to reins. Uh, I don't think it says that you have to be all on the left or anything like that. It can be different different ways of doing it. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, we all get, you know, <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so uh, why mention this at all? Exactly. That's that's what I was. I kind of came to that same exactly that same conclusion. Uh, is there any significant meaning? Thank you, Ajahn. So there you are. That's my take on that. Uh. Okay. But I, I don't think it means everything was sitting on, everyone was sitting on the left. I don't think that's what it means. Uh. Anyway. <laughs> Next one. Ajahn, some of us, uh, including me, did not attend the meditation retreat. Uh, 
after going through the part two suttas, I feel that it would be extremely helpful if Ajahn should go through the main points <laughs> and relevance of those suttas, uh, especially Anapanasati Sutta, and how it is both a Samatha and Vipassana practice. <laughs> um, I, I, I will be doing many of the things that we did in the uh, uh, suttas anyway, because many I will be having a look at the Satipatthana Sutta probably, and many other things. So we, we will be talking about those topics. Uh, but one of the advantages of uh, going through different topics is that you look at uh, same thing through different perspectives. Uh, so instead of doing Anapanasati once more, I will be doing other things uh, and essentially talking about the same issues. Uh. And if you want, would like to t hear about Samatha and Vipassana practice, you can ask that question. I didn't talk about that in great detail. Uh. So you can just ask a question about it. Maybe this is the question. Maybe this, maybe this is the question. <laughs> uh, but I'm very happy to talk about that because it is a it's kind of important to uh, have some idea about the uh, Samatha and Vipassana and what they uh, are all about. I won't talk about it now because it's getting a little bit too late, uh, but if you wish to bring this up again, please do so, and we can maybe talk about it tomorrow evening or on Sunday night or something uh, like that. Uh. Okay, hello Ajahn. Um, how is vo Sangha different from Chaga, Patanisika, Muti and Analaya? Four of the five Indriyas appear directly related to the gradual training here, yeah? right? Takskaduha. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh. Uh, that means that's Norwegian, that means thank you. Uh. So that's, uh, that's great. Uh. So, uh, <laughs> how is vo Sangha different from uh, Chaga? Uh, uh, how did you learn Norwegian? Uh, uh, Google? Google Translate. <laughs> okay, so why, why Yin has been using Google Translate? Okay, excellent. Uh, so, and these terms are, they have their own specific sphere of usage that they are used in their own kind of way. Uh, and they also have their usage where they overlap. So it's a bit of both, yeah? And this is kind of the thing uh, about these terms. Uh, they are used uh, differently and also similarly. So a term like chaga uh, often has the idea of generosity. It is often used in that connection. Uh, but uh, in the more uh, general meaning of chaga is kind of just to uh, get rid of things uh, or relinquish things. Uh. So in that sense, it is also very uh, re related to Patanisaka. Patanisaka ha has a more of a technical sense, often used more in terms in meditation at a uh, setting, a patanisaka, where you give something up uh, mentally, for example, but patanisaka can also be used in terms of giving up in terms of generosity. Uh. So both chaga and patanisaka can be used as uh, uh, giving to others, uh, but also a kind of just giving up mentally uh, uh, in, in the same way. Uh. Muti, well, muti is a term which means liberation, related to vimuti. Uh, yeah, so you liberate. Something and when you give something away, I guess you are liberating yourself a little bit. Yeah, you give it, you give it up. So kind of giving it away. Uh. So muti, uh, muti hatta f uh, means like uh, 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 muti hatta hatta muti hatta. I think it is. That's what it is. Uh, in one of the uh, where you are kind of giving up things from your hand. Yeah, liberating it from your hand, uh, and then that's kind of the uh, part of generosity as well. Uh. And analaya is a, a term which means something like non-attachment. Uh, and uh, uh, alaya is obviously related to the uh, uh, Himalaya, and uh, Himalaya is like where the snow attaches or the snow lies. Uh, analaya is the negative of that, so non attachment, non lying, non clinging, non support, or whatever. Uh, so, Vosanga is very closely related to Patinisaga, uh, it's only the, uh, the prefix that is different there. Uh, but again, the same idea. And Vosanga too can be used often both in terms of giving away. Uh, yeah, you have the uh, Vosanga. I'm going to have to look this up. I'm going a little bit by memory now, so it's a little bit vague. But Vosanga, I'm pretty sure, is also used in terms of giving things away, uh, uh, but also giving up. So all of these terms seem to have pretty much that dual meaning, uh, whereby you can either mean giving in terms of generosity or in terms of giving something up which is more like a mental act of give, giving something up. Uh, um, 
So Vosaga, I think, is only used in that particular context when the, the context of the uh, Samad Indriya, uh, the, uh, fa the, um, um, the faculty of, of uh, stillness or Samadhi, is only used in that particular context apart from the idea of giving up or generosity. I think that is the pretty much the only one. It's quite rarely used in the sense of mental giving up, uh, and that seems to be one of the few, few places. Uh, uh, so, yeah. And this is one of the things about the Buddha. He likes to often use different terms in different places, uh, and that is the kind of strength in the teaching, because when you have different terms uh, in different ways and using lots of synonyms, uh, it means that it's more, uh, much less likely for the teachings to go wrong, because you have all these uh, extra you know, things coming together, uh, all these extra viewpoints, if you like, and str strength that strengthens the, uh, uh, the message of the Dhamma. So that that's why there's so much repetition often in the suttas. Uh, Okay. Ah, hello. Actually, hello is with an A. That's also Norwegian, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Now I get it. I was wondering. It looks a bit funny. There's an A instead of an E. And I <laughs> see that. So you're really testing me. Are you trying to check if I'm really Norwegian or not? Is that what it is? Uh, do you have doubts? Maybe you think that I'm being a bit dodgy. Maybe I have told. <laughs> Take my day. Okay. That's very kind of you. Okay. I should have known you were coming from a very good intention here. <laughs> Four of the five indriyas appear directly related to the gradual training. Is that right? Uh, I would say probably all five of them uh, can be related directly to the gradual training. Uh, the, if the gradual training it starts off with hearing the Buddha's teaching and getting, getting faith in the teaching, sadda is specifically mentioned. Uh, 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 virya, well, virya is is a little bit more tricky. But if we define virya as uh, effort, uh, then that too would be would be right there. It would be part of the um, uh, sense restraint and maybe the uh, satisampajanya and that part of it. Uh, sorry, there is no sila in the vi in the five indriyas. Uh. Indriya sangara sila. Huh? Yeah. S sila is miss si well, sila is missing in the five indriyas. Uh, yeah, well, the sila is missing in the five indriyas. Uh, yeah. yeah, so that part, so that part is not. Yeah, so that part of the gradual training is not there. Uh, but you said four of the five indriyas, uh, but I think all five indriyas are actually reflected in there. Yeah, so that's what that that's what I'm referring to. So you have the uh, first of all the sadda, then you have the virya, which is pretty much related to the sen uh, indriya sangvara sila. Uh, Possibly, uh, yeah. If you are, if you are a little bit kind of broad about it, uh, then you have the sati. Uh, so where, where is the sati related to? And that it can be related to many things, but I think mainly to the banning of the five hindrances, uh, because that is the purpose of satipatthana is to ban the five hindrances. That's sati. Then of course samadhi is the five, uh, the four, four jhanas, the five jhanas, whatever you want to say, four or five. Uh, yeah, whatever. Okay. <laughs> and then of course the uh, tevija at the very end is the, then the panyendriya the faculty of uh, so i think that all five arguably are there here tak skal du ha takkelige mode that's the that's your welcome in norwegian here <laughs> okay so there you are here good Mr. yes please on that uh, five injury here yeah it's the two pair the the <laughs> concentration and uh okay and uh, energy, right? Mm. And then uh, wisdom and uh, faith. Faith. Yeah. With the uh, with the uh, sati as the you know the 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 key. Yeah. But uh, you know, I've been I I read some books you know a long time ago when I first started learning about mm. Buddhism. It said to balance. Wisdom and uh, the faith, and then uh, energy and concentration. Yeah. So when I practice, I, I always try to balance, mm. you know, that energy and concentration. Yeah. So if uh, you know, if you want to get to the jhana, the yeah. concentration has to be higher, won't it? Mm. To the higher level than uh, mm. the energy, right? I mean, the, the, the higher, beca the, the, p the point is really that when you get to jhana, you also have lots of energy. It's just a different kind of energy. It's not the restless energy, but it is the energy of the mind. So the energy comes with it automatically here. Yeah. Well, so wouldn't uh, the concentration have to be higher in order to, you know, 
if you want to keep the balance, both energy and... Uh, uh, th this whole idea of balance is not in the suttas, it's from the commentaries. Uh, yeah, yeah, but... <laughs> it's com commentarial things. So the problem with the idea of balance, and now this was pointed out to me by Ajahn Brahm a long time ago, is that when we talk about balance, sometimes to get things in balance you have to lower one. Right. Yeah, so say, say, that, say that samadhi and virya are out of balance, maybe you have to lower your samadhi. But that's always wrong. Yeah? You, can, you shouldn't lower your samadhi if your samadhi is going really well. Uh, <laughs> or if your wisdom and faith are out of balance, maybe you have to lower your wisdom. That would be crazy. Uh. So sometimes the idea of balance can give the wrong idea yeah, uh, when you practice I think this. So, yeah. that that's when I first started practicing, that's what yeah. I have been doing, you know, yeah. trying to, to, ba <laughs> to balance. Yeah. And uh, and then some people said that uh, you shouldn't have the concentration, you know, samadhi too high. <laughs> okay. Because yeah, yeah, and this yeah. is the monks, you know, many yeah. many masters monks. Yeah. And he said that you know, oh, oh, I told him you know I I was the uh, sitting in uh, Bodhgaya and um, I just you know went up and uh, and. Uh, yeah. Very high, smarty, and Good, uh, excellent. I was Wonderful. sitting for a long yeah. time. Yeah. I by the yeah. time I knew it, a lot of Indians were yeah. all around me. Yeah. And he said, and he told me, so what good is that? <laughs> <laughs> he said, that, you know, the smarty is yeah. too high. No, that's 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 really bad. And that's that's kind of taking the commentaries, giving the commentaries precedence over the suttas. That's what that means. Uh, and that is always the wrong wrong thing to do. Huh? The suttas should always take precedence. It is taken, I think, where this idea comes from, it comes from one of the, the sutta with Sona, you know, Sona, who was w walking very hard. He was doing walking meditation. He was bleeding from the soles of his feet because he was walking, walking meditation so hard. Uh, and that's when the Buddha goes to him and says, you should find the even, the, the evenness in the, uh, in the faculties. Uh, yeah, that's what it says. Uh, but it doesn't define it clearly. It doesn't say that you should you know, have less samadhi. It doesn't say that at all. He just says that each faculty should be even according to itself. Uh, that's what, how I would understand it. So you should find the balanced kind of energy. The energy shouldn't be completely so crazy that you're bleeding from the soles of your feet. Uh, because too much walking meditation. Yeah, you, need to <laughs> you need to sit down a little bit. Uh, mm. So that I... I so I th I think that is the r the wrong the, the wrong advice and that and I think this shows us one of the problems in large parts of the Buddhist tradition where we put pre they pre put preference to the commentaries and the later things rather than the suttas and that is where sometimes we get it completely wrong here. I, th I don't think the Buddha would have been, would have agreed with that that you should reduce your samadhi. I think that would be that is exactly what you should not be doing here. I think that is is wonderful when you're getting I good samadhi. I think here. What he meant is to keep it in the level of consciousness, where it's you still aware, you know, <coughs> what you're doing. In just I don't know what he meant, but I, I think it was wrong, <laughs> regardless. <sir. laughs> and uh, and uh, that, so when I practice, yeah. this is what I always you know, try to do, had to yeah. be under my consciousness. <laughs> I was afraid, you yeah. know, <laughs> well, I lose. Yeah, no, you don't have to worry about that because remember that with the, when you practice deep samadhi, all of the other qualities of the path come with it already. There's enough energy there, there's enough sati there, everything is there because, you c because the foundation for attaining jhanas and samadhi is always the right sati, it is always the right virya. They have to be in place for this to happen. So there's nothing, you don't have to worry about any of those things. Uh, it is not, a, it's not an issue. Uh, so the deeper the samadhi is, the, uh, the better it is in this kind of situation. Well, so. for many years did I practice <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it yeah. maybe I had to try to, you know, let go of that. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I would, yeah, no, that, I think that is, uh, that is, yeah, let go <laughs> of those ideas. They're not really, <laughs> I don't think they are right, to be honest with you. Huh? Yeah. yeah. But sometimes, you know, I just lost the consciousness, you just went up. Yeah. But that without my consciousness, that I conscious of. <laughs> okay. So okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. Sir. Hello, uh, Ajahn. Uh, yeah. This is about, uh, uh, I have a comment about one of the questions that uh, was raised yesterday about uh, the Bikuni ordination about Mahapajapati, the story about uh, Ananda oh yeah, yeah. pleading with uh, Buddha. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, I, I, I'm not sure where I get the source, but I, I heard that uh, there's a problem with the chronological order of that story. Yeah. Because I, I think be that event happens five years after Buddha enlightenment, right? And then Maybe, Ananda yeah. was yeah. born uh, around the time when Buddha was enlightened, so Ananda would have been five years old at that time. So yeah. that make the story kind of implausible. Okay, well, the, 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 this chronological order is based very much on the commentaries and uh, you know, the, the ages when these things happened, uh, you know, whether it happened five years, it's quite likely that the nuns were ordained quite soon, you know, so five years maybe not so such a bad, bad estimate, but whether Ananda was born when the Buddha got enlightened, I don't know. To me, I'm not sure if that is correct. Uh, this is some kind of commentarial thing that uh, I, I don't know where that age comes from. Ananda was uh, one of the people who ordained together with the other Sakyans. Yeah, when all the Sakyans ordained, he was one of those, wasn't he one of those Sakyans who ordained? Uh, from in the... I double check with on the wiki, I'm not sure where the source came from, yeah. and I also heard it, I'm not, I cannot remember where I get the source of information anymore, yeah. okay. but I, I, yeah. I, I know, what I knew is that the age gap between Buddha and Ananda is quite huge. That, yeah. That's what, that was what I remember. Yeah, that, that I think this, I, I've heard this argument before, and I, I, I'm w w looking at Wikipedia, is that what you were looking or? Uh, yeah. yeah? Well, Wikipedia is not, not always, when it comes to little details like that, it's not always 100% reliable, so it's not uncertain. A lot of the, you know, I know like Ad Adan Sudato has sometimes felt he had to really rewrite some of those Wikipedia articles because they were really kind of not, not right. Uh, so, uh, it, it, it also depends on how you, you know, what your at view of Buddhism is, to what extent you use the commentaries and all these kind of things to inform your view. Uh, so uh, maybe, maybe, maybe that maybe there's a point there. There could be a chronological problem there, uh, but I think that um, it is. I'm not sure if it is a very strong. It is an argument, but not a very strong argument, probably, uh, because of the weaknesses of of the our, our knowledge of these uh, these issues. Uh, so that's that would be my take on it. Uh, but uh, I'm just talking off the top of my head. I haven't really gotten all the, you know, the kind of relevant uh, things in front of me. So. Uh, Okay, last question for today. We're already going a little bit over time, so we'll do this one. Uh, dear Ajahn, Samadhi is a state of mind attained by letting go. Translation to immersion gives me a meaning there is still a strong self in it. Uh, okay, ma yeah, maybe. Uh, I feel to translate to stillness is a better word. I, I tend to agree with you, actually. I, I prefer stillness myself. Uh, in the Chinese scriptures, samadhi is translated to stillness as well. Yeah, I've heard that before, actually. That samadhi is, is uh, translated as stillness in the Chinese scriptures. So, uh, so that is a good precedent, yeah? If it, is, uh, there, if it was used by the Chinese when they translated the suttas originally 1,500 years ago, that's not a bad reason for, for doing it now. But I agree with you. I think for many reasons, I, I don't find immersion to be a very good trans translation myself. But remember that the interesting thing is that we are so different as people. And some people may feel, yeah, this is just right. Yeah, this kind of fit, hits it perfectly. Huh? And other people think it, stillness is better. Some may still feel like concentration is better. Huh? So we are, we are different, and for some people it kind of hits a different thing inside of us, and it kind of makes sense to you. Huh? And this is one of the nice things, is that we are, it's okay to disagree about these things. There isn't any final translation that is correct for everyone. Huh? It may just vary depending on various things. Huh? So, uh, um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know. So I, I think it's uh, sometimes better just to be open-minded. But uh, and sometimes having all three translations together, yeah, gives you a kind of very rounded idea of what it is about. Uh, and sometimes we need to discuss these terms uh, to really get an understanding for what they mean. Only through discussion do they really start to work. Yeah. Okay, are you happy with that? Uh, is the person? Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Great. So shall we pay respects to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha and then? Uh, yeah.